We have a guest this episode. No, it's not Bobblehead Andres Iniesta or Bobblehead Bob Ross. My guest is of the human variety, a box-to-box, canvas-to-canvas expert with over 40 years of experience in his craft. Want to meet him? Stick around. Hi everyone and welcome to the Soccer Collectible Show, the channel for the history and value of soccer memorabilia. My name is Jonathan Kastner. I'm an appraiser with National Appraisal Consultants and I'm a sports memorabilia specialist with Alda for Auction here in Pennsylvania. Before we get to our guest, I want to talk a little bit about German football memorabilia. Germany has won four World Cup trophies and three European championships. Its teams have won the Champions League and Europa League numerous times. Its women's national team has been very successful too, winning a World Cup in 2003 and several European championships. Its football association has more registered players than any other in Europe. And for more than all of its success, it has been the center of European football structure and unity. Here are some fan-related items for the national team. Tip and Tap World Cup 1974 mascot figurines have sold for around $100. World Cup 1974 Panini figurines have sold for 170 pounds. The 1954 World Cup poster sold for 2,000 pounds at auction. A 1954 World Cup program has sold for 450 pounds at auction. And a group of 1954 World Cup tickets have sold for 480 pounds at auction. When it comes to club football success in Germany, five teams have mattered the most. Borussia Dortmund, Bayern Munich, Borussia Mönchengladbach, Hamburg, and Schalke. Schalke was the best team under the Third Reich, they won the league six times in ten years. Dortmund won three titles in the 1950s and early 60s. The 1970s were all about Borussia Mönchengladbach and Bayern Munich. Hamburg did well in the early 80s before Bayern started dominating again in the 1990s. And here we are again today. Bayern have won eight league titles in a row, 20, 29 league titles overall. But these are just numbers. What matters most to collectors are the great players. And Germany has had a lot of them. Gerd Müller, Jürgen Klinsmann, Lothar Matthäus. Franz Beckenbauer, Paul Breitner, Gunther Netzer, Andy Muller. You could just go down the list. There's a lot of them. Unfortunately, most of the match-worn items that are being sold in the market today are for, not for these great players, but for more common players. If we go back even further, you'll find fewer vintage items on the market. Its owners have not parted with the items, or they remain in a museum. Here are some match-worn items to give you an idea of some prices on the market. First, we have some international shirts. Mario Goetz's 2014 World Cup group stage match worn shirt versus the USA brought $600 at auction. Tomas Linka's 2002 World Cup final match worn shirt versus Brazil, it did not sell. It did not reach the $2,500 minimum bid at auction. Kiat Mulo's 1974 World Cup group stage match worn shirt versus Australia, that brought over $4,500. Siegfried Held's 1966 World Cup final match worn shirt versus England brought £10,000 at auction. Here we have a sample of match-worn Bundesliga shirts. Most of these are common. Heiko Vogel's match-worn Borussia Mönchengladbach shirt from the year 2000 brought 270 euros. Torsten Fring's match-worn Werder Bremen shirt from 2006 brought 226 dollars. Oliver Kahn's match-worn Bayern Munich goalkeeping shirt from 2001 brought 153 dollars. And Roy Prager's match-worn Hamburg shirt from 2000 brought 280 euros. So where do you find these items? Well, you have the usual sellers for football memorabilia. Grand Bud Auctions, eBay. Classic Football Shirts is a big seller of match-worn shirts. Then we have Aegon Sports World. Aegon Sports World in Germany is probably the biggest seller of match-worn German football shirts. You can find their information here. So without further ado, let's introduce our guest. He has over 40 years of experience as a personal property appraiser and is a senior partner of National Appraisal Consultants. He is an appraiser instructor, a university professor, and a published author. He was also a co-host of the nationally syndicated Value This with Brian and Leon, a public radio antiques and collectibles talk show. He has a PhD in valuation science, so when it comes to valuing memorabilia, no one knows more. Welcome our guest, my dad, Leon Kastner. So before we talk about soccer collectibles, uh, I want to get into what what, what an appraisal is. What, uh, why would someone need an appraisal for their memorabilia or anything for that matter? Um, a lot of people come to me saying, what's an appraisal exactly? I want to know what my stuff is worth, but why would I need one? Um, good, John. There's a lot of different reasons people need appraisals. 
Uh, there are formal reasons, like someone might uh, have died, in the, and it, so it's part of an estate. It could be a donation, someone's donating something to a museum. Uh, it could be a divorce, where they're splitting up property a couple of different ways. It could be a bankruptcy, where they're going, uh, declaring either personal or business bankruptcy. Or someone may just want to know what an item is. Generally, people will call and say, listen, I have something, I want to know what it's worth. That's the hardest question for us to answer because what it's worth depends on what they need the appraisal for. In other words, there's different types of values for different things. And as the appraiser, you're the person that knows what type of value for what intended use, which market you go to, and what prices you choose. So, for example, if I just want to know what it's worth because I might want to sell it, that's going to be a different value than if I want to get insurance for something? Absolutely, because if you want to sell something, you're not a retail shop. So you don't have the advertising, you don't have the promotion, you don't have people coming to you uh, to look for specific things, collectors, uh, you, you're not providing them authenticity, etc. And so when you go to sell something, you are limited, if you will, and so the price that you can get is probably going to be lower than a retail shop would get. So what, when you say, what is this worth? Well, it depends. If you're going to sell it, it's worth one thing. If a store, a recognized store, even if it's on the internet, is going to sell something, they have a high reputation behind them, it's going to be worth something else. It's probably be a higher figure. So why would somebody, why couldn't somebody just go and research? With all the information that's available online, with, you, know, you could just Google it and check eBay or some of these auction sites like Live Auctioneers. Why would you use a professional as opposed to just going and finding out what stuff is worth on your own? Well, it's certainly a good idea, particularly with the tools that everyone has today, to look up things on your own, to try to find things. But for example, people generally go to the granddaddy eBay, and so they'll type in something and then a list of thousands of items that appear to be similar to what they have will come up. The problem is that the prices there are listed prices, they're asking prices, they're not sale prices. And in addition, the people that are looking at their item assume that it's identical with the one that's listed, and that's not always the, the case. The appraiser is the one that then is able to look at an item and then bring up comparables that really are comparable to the one that you're selling, and then they're able to analyze it and adjust it in, according to different what we call value characteristics, whether it's up or down. And so the appraiser has the knowledge to do that, whereas the homeowner doesn't. And also, I would think that an appraiser would be a little bit more objective than somebody who's trying to do it themselves, whether they're trying to manipulate the data or something, would that come, come into it as well? Well, yeah, everybody always thinks that their own stuff is worth more right. than they think. The appraiser, the professional appraiser is supposed to be unbiased, uh, impartial, and objective. So there's no, nothing comes in, the appraiser is just looking at it and then almost scientifically then assigning a value to it without any kind of prejudice the homeowner doesn't do or the collector doesn't do that they have an invested interest in it and they always kind of give it more value than it may necessarily have I would think especially if people have or an individual or even an institution like a museum if they have a lot of items that they need to be appraised it would be sort of time consuming to have to go in and list every item make sure that you inspect every item because inspection is part of it right you got to right, look exactly. at it make sure the condition is right and then um, obviously getting it in some kind of spreadsheet or having and then having to do the research and then coming up with a report that takes care of everything right uh, there, there's a there's like three parts to the appraisal process one is identification properly identifying the item, describing it, knowing the age, the origin, uh, the maker, etc. And number two is evaluating it in terms of its condition. Um, of course, we in baseball cards, sports memorabilia, you know they have grading, so it goes on a scale like 1 to 10. Other objects, and most other objects, we don't have a grading system. So therefore, the appraiser is the one that then has to analyze and put it in context, if you will, in terms of it's a lower end of the scale or a higher end of the right. scale. And number three, then the appraiser will sign that the eval uh, put a value on it depending on the intended use of the appraisal. Right. And, and so then the appraiser will put that all together, they'll justify the values, and when I mean justify, it means is there a foundation for this? Where did the numbers come from? Did they pick them out of their head, or is it an established record somewhere? Right. We see a lot of prices out there, and there's a lot of soccer memorabilia out there, but it's, there's not as much out there as there is for American sports, right? So 
you look at like American baseball where you've got over 150 years of professional baseball or close to it and you see just you know so many uh, baseball cards and game worn shirts and you know baseball gloves and all these things and the T206 uh, was it 212 cards that are worth yeah, nearly a million right. dollars right. Right. we don't see that with soccer if you look at memorabilia you know let's say since we're talking about Germany for example and we'll get into the, the sort of the history of uh, the different periods in Germany of, of professional international football and how things changed after the war um, but do you think it's because America maybe has had this high standard of living for so long and a higher middle class that so people have been able to spend a lot more money on stuff and then hold on to it because they got a bigger house? So yeah, I, 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 I think, think it's just a cultural kind I think of collecting. That it, yeah, I think that is part of it is the fact that America, we tend to collect, we tend to buy things uh, that remind us of... Uh, of what we like and, and who we revere, whereas perhaps in other countries they didn't do that or they didn't, they, they recognized their players, but they didn't seem to, uh, it, it didn't, and the marketing aspect wasn't part of that country's culture. Right, right. And so it took a heck of a long time for them to realize that, uh, even as kids, is that maybe we want something that resembles, you know, a player that I liked, right. that it would be nice to own something like that. And I think we've seen that develop uh, even here in the United States. So do you think it would be safe to say that the British and American markets for memorabilia are still driving sort of the international scene in terms of collectibles? Like, for example, we see the auction houses, the sports memorabilia auction houses, they're really based uh, here in the U.S. or in the U.K. with Graham Budd. Um, and I noticed even the prices for memorabilia for so soccer memorabilia at Grand Bud, they tend to be much higher for English items, right? As opposed to German items, which are a little bit lower or mm -hmm. considerably lower. So it could be someone like Nobby Styles, who was known for being had such great moments in the '66 World Cup. Now nobody else knows who Nobby Styles is around the world. Nobody cares. But in '66, he was an important hero in England. Not not the least of you know uh, Jeff Hurst or Bobby Moore. Nobby Styles is a big hero. So his match worn shirt sold very well. His shirt was sold for 75,000 pounds. And you're like, Nobby Styles, who the heck is he? But in England, that, that makes a big difference. Sure, sure. Now you look at players like Gerd Moller or you know, Franz Beckenbauer, who I consider to be one of the most revolutionary players of all time. His shirt doesn't sell that well. Even his Cosmos memorabilia, maybe two, three thousand dollars at auction. Um, and then his Germany shirts that have sold maybe, certainly under $5,000, which if you look at it like Beckenbauer styles, it's, it's about the market. It's not necessarily about how good the player is. It's, it's how, yeah. it's what people want. It, or they're the trends. They're the, it's, it's the, it's where the sale is being held. You know, this may have something to do with the country and the country's history. Is that, is that, is that something that may be about their culture? It where could have been a culture. It could have been the wartime situation. Uh, it, it should be, it, you know, could be, I, I, there's probably a term paper there somewhere yeah. in terms of why German soccer memorabilia is not as interest as maybe other countries. And it probably has something to do with their culture and their history. And they were coming out of World War II and, and so... Austerity they, maybe, uh, figuring could, that. Yeah, could be. be rationing, you, you, know? you save what you have and you don't spend, yeah. just won't spend money on things, yeah. you know. Now, for example, I... I went to uh, Germany, as you know, I think it was in 1970, right? Right, And I saw a game there. It was with, with my family, and the family th was very excited to take me to a game. Right. And so I was excited to go, not that I knew anything, I didn't know anything at all about the teams or players, yeah. but I was going to a professional sport game yeah. in Germany. Right. And I remember going, and I remember the excitement of the crowd. Yeah. I remember I, one thing: we stood up the entire time. They had railings, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and you stood up. You yeah, had yeah, a beer yeah. in one hand, but you had, yeah. I, and you had flags all over the yeah. place. You, could, you know, couldn't hardly see the field because of the flags waving and the yeah. songs yeah. and the cheering. And I don't remember a thing about the game. Yeah. I don't remember who played it or whatever, but I remember the atmosphere. Yeah. It was. Uh, it was a big deal, right. you know. I, yeah. I remember even when when we went to go in the car, it was like the car was nice and clean, and we had to make sure everything was fine. We had to get there on time, and we, uh, you know, we, everything was like, it was like a big holiday. Yeah. And um, and and it was certainly enjoyable from a cultural point of view. Right. And it was like, 
it's like you were part of a crowd thing. You did you didn't dare go there and just sit down or right. just kind of look. Right. Not at all. You were part of the action for the whole time. So another thing I wanted to touch on was new memorabilia. And we've seen new shirts, um, prices for new shirts this past year, the prices have just gone down dramatically because there's not a lot of, we had, we had a period where there wasn't any soccer being played and now you know they're picking up the season again obviously and we're gonna be finishing up in a few weeks. But the memorabilia in some cases is 50% lower for the replica shirts, the shirt that I'm wearing, I, I purchased this for ninety dollars. It's selling for less than fifty dollars now, it's selling for about forty-five. So fifty percent lower, uh, and they're trying to give get get rid of all the shirts because now we have the new shirts coming out, right? So we have all the new shirts for twenty twenty one that are coming out. Right. So what do you do with all that inventory? You mark it down, and you hope in a few years that people are going right. to. So what I think will happen is you're going to have a lot of this memorabilia is kind of sort of flood the market a little bit preserved so we're going to see a lot of um, in a few years we're going to see a lot of 2020 memorabilia that people have that either just don't want or if it's synonymous with COVID if this goes on for a couple of years then obviously it'll be the next year but um, so th that to me is an interesting thing what, what happens to this memorabilia what happens to the memorabilia market with the newer stuff you know? Yeah, I don't. I don't think I would go out and and buy a whole bunch of current uh, shirts just because they're low. Right. Okay, uh, hoping to make an investment on that. Right. I, I and now maybe you think that's a wise idea, and so go ahead and do it. I don't necessarily think it is. Um, I think you're dealing again. You're dealing with the middle of the road. And, and when we say shirts, we're not. These aren't game worn shirts. These right. are just regular retail shirts. Right. So you have no idea how many of these may exist. Right. Millions. That are not sold. Millions. So yeah. you're buying it at fifty percent off, but who knows? Later there'll be millions of them flood the market, and it would go down to fifty percent of what you paid for. Right. So since you don't know uh, the supply, I would be very careful. If you have a game worn, or particularly a game worn specific game specific incident, you you then limit. You know you know how rare it is. There's only one of those that exist, and so therefore that's a pretty good bet to to grab onto. You know I think going going back to when we were talking about German football and, and value, I think the reason why I wanted to use German football sort of as a as an example, we could, I could have picked any country. I could have picked Italy, I could have picked Spain, I could have picked Portugal or whoever. I picked Germany because I wanted to show that as a country who's experienced so much success at the international level and has had so much success at club level, the memorabilia is still not as high as you might think it would be. Same thing with Brazil. I could have picked Brazil. I could have picked all these great players from Brazil if you go down the line you know, to Zico and Socrates and all these great players, their match war memorabilia is, is, is valuable. And it's certainly of all the match war memorabilia out there is the most valuable, but it's not maybe what you think it would be. It doesn't compare to the American uh, game worn items that are out there. Um, if somebody knows, if there is, because a lot of these people that buy and sell, we call them dealers, right? So there are a lot of um, football collectible, soccer collectible dealers. That are out there and a lot of them are based in England and so let's say somebody has a collection of a ton of you know 1500 match worn shirts and they need to get it appraised in England for insurance the same way we would here mm -hmm. obviously they have different um, they have some some things are going to be a little bit different in how they handle that but they're still going to need that to, to come up with a value right right so why would somebody like that who's got who's just born and bred in the game grew up following whoever, has been around, has all these shirts, knows all the history, could tell you what he was, the pie he was eating at that game, you know, what pub he went to. Why is that person going to go to somebody like you or I and ask, and we're, this is kind of we're coming full circle with right, this, right. Why, why are they going to ask us for memorabilia when they figure that they know everything? Well, that might be true, and they may know more than us. There's a lot of people, I do a lot of appraisals on a whole host of things where the people know more than I do about the items because they're collectors, because they've spent a lot of time and effort. And that's fine. Uh, however, it's the appraisal knowledge they don't have. Right. And it's the fact that uh, they are biased, 
Right. They're usually uh, not objective. Right. They're not impartial. Right. So you need that impartial uh, third person who is a professional trained in the mechanics right. and the methodology of valuation. And just as we started out by saying there are a lot of different values for things and it depends on the intended use, again, insurance coverage is an intended use. It has a specific value or cost. It's called estimated replacement cost. The appraiser knows what that is. The homeowner, collector, or dealer does not know what that right. is. So this is a chance where you work with the appraiser right. and you're able to then discuss the, the, the um, property you have, give them all the hints and all the knowledge you know about that, and then the appraiser is able to take it and then you know, do the analysis, come up with the values, and put the appraisal in a proper form so it's accepted by a third party. An insurance company is not going to accept an appraisal done by yourself. Right. If you own the property, right. the IRS isn't going to accept that. Third parties will not accept that. So you need the appraiser. So get an appraiser that you're comfortable with, not an appraiser who's necessarily going to tilt values, but one that you're comfortable in talking with that knows the game like you do, and you can discuss things, and then the appraiser knows how to take that information and finish off the job. Expert opinion is very important. If you have any questions for Leon, you can email him at leonkastner, all one word, at comcast.net. You can also visit nacvalue.com to learn more about the appraisal process and how his firm may be able to help you with your appraisal needs. That just about does it for this episode. I want to thank my father for sharing some knowledge with us. Uh, if you have any interesting stories or items that need to be appraised, you can email us at the Soccer Collectible Show all one word at gmail.com. Also, don't forget to hit subscribe. Take care, everyone. Stay safe.